made you want to go to Uganda and next year's high school winter retreat, didn't you? I was like, wow, like, why do I just want to do everything that he is talking about right now? Um, hey, uh, man, we're excited about this next season, and I do want to lean in. Uh, in in these next three weeks, we are starting this series, and we're going to uh, go through this series called Wrestling with Destiny. Uh, I am going to be speaking like I'm in a Star Trek movie um, throughout this whole, you guys hearing that? That's awesome. I feel like somebody's going to beam me up right now. Okay, I'm going to... Um, Talk a little bit more about wrestling with destiny at the end, but I do want you to, uh, if, you, if you've ever thought about saying, hey, this is a series that I might wanna skip, no way. This series is the story of our church, but also the vision that God has for us in the coming year. So I'm gonna switch mics. Where's the um, handheld? We got a handheld back there? We good? All right, handheld's coming. Um, so, uh, what have we been looking at over the last three weeks? We've been looking at this idea of gather. It's not just a theme uh, for our year. It is what God has called us to do. Thank you, Sean. How's this? How's this? Okay. Okay. First, before I go any further, I want you guys to thank all of these guys in our tech booth back here. Uh, they have done an incredible job today. Uh, we walked in here, and we are a portable church, and we never know what we're going to unpack. And uh, uh, starting this morning, uh, they've had to uh, duct tape, put chewing gum in, uh, kickstart, uh, get the defibrillator on some equipment uh, pretty much all morning. And they've done a fantastic job uh, just getting sound through those speakers. Uh, so I just want to uh, say to them, they do an incredible job. And on your way out or if you see them uh, in the lobby on your way out, just tell them, we're so thankful that you get in here early uh, and set this place up so that we can hear music and we can hear what's being communicated from the stage and that it goes out into the highways and the byways all over and around the world. That is because of their service to this church. So thank you guys very much. Can we give them one more hand to say thank you? And they fix broken stuff. All right, so gather is our theme for 2019. Why are we making this the theme? Because we feel like God has said, I want you, I want you to remind not only the people in this gathering, but anybody who can hear that he has reserved essential encounters for his gathered people, for his gathered church, which means this, yes, God wants to speak to us in solitude. He wants to speak to us when we are reading the Bible and we are journaling by ourselves. He wants to speak to us when we're fasting and praying and going after him in those, in those quiet, alone places. But always so that we will come back to his community, so that we will love and do great works in his community, so that we will grow and go together in the things that we've already sung about and that we've already talked about this morning. So when we talk about gather and we talk about what is a gathering, we're talking about the assembly of a group of people, the same group of people at the same time with the same vision. That is a local church. Now, we've been looking at the barriers that oftentimes we put up, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously, and why it is that we find it hard sometimes to gather with the church. Last week, we talked about the fact that one of the reasons we don't gather with the church is because of flawed people. There's people in the church that are flawed. Yes, news, news alert. People who will hurt us, people who will annoy us, people who will frustrate us. But we resolved that tension last week and we're going to look further into another huge barrier that keeps us from gathering with the church. In fact, I would say this is the biggest one that we're gonna talk about today. So uh, would you stand with me for the public reading of the scriptures? Uh, if you're new to Brentwood Church, this is something that we have begun to do through this series as a way of unifying us in the vision, but also in the teaching of what God is gonna say through his scriptures today. We're in Hebrews chapter 10, so follow along with me, say it loud and say it proud. Here we go. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. 
By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you use the scriptures, the scriptures that you have placed before us in this time, in this moment, to inspire us, to challenge us, to grow us, to grow us in love and great works, to grow us up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we do just that today. And it is in Jesus' name that I pray this. Amen. You may be seated. There is a certain quick service restaurant that I love. In fact, not only here locally, but across the nation. In most locations, when I go to this quick service restaurant, I have an exceed expectations experience, both with the customer service and the product. Some of you have those moments with that brand or that restaurant that you love, except for one location, one location. It seems like it's that sibling that hasn't quite launched with the rest of the family. Do you have that sibling in your family where, where you're just like, man, like, like you can do this. Well, there's this one location of this one franchise that every time I would go there, I would always have this mediocre or subpar experience with. Uh, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you walk into a quick service restaurant and it's almost like they're angry that you're there. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, like you, 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 yeah, let there be light. Like, like you, you, you go up to the counter or, or to the drive-thru and you say, yeah, I would like combo number 12. <sighs> like you just ruined Christmas. Like, 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 like you just ruined the lives of everyone back there because you want to give them your money. Well, I have had this experience at this particular location, at this particular franchise, more than once, to the point where I just stopped going. I was just like, you know what? I I've lost confidence in this location, not in the brand itself, but in this location. But yesterday, yesterday I was heading to the LU basketball game, which they won, by the way. Go Flames. Yes, awesome. Yes, uh, it was a great game, wonderful game. My father-in-law and my youngest son were with me in the car, and neither of them had had dinner. And so we were heading to the game, and he says, hey, could we stop by? And he, he, he told me the name of the franchise, and I, I said, absolutely, we can. And I thought to myself, we're already going to be late for the game. The closest location is that location. And so I thought to myself, oh, should I do this? Maybe I should give them another chance. Maybe in the time between they have regained their vision, they have, they have retrained themselves, they, they are ready for me again, they're ready to make this relationship right again. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We get to the drive through My father-in-law orders a combo. My son orders a combo. I've already eaten, so I order a large coffee. I'd like a large coffee, please. And I could hear... The, the subconscious sigh in that moment, almost like, <sighs> yep, there's a guy here who's going to ruin all of our lives with this coffee order. Uh, sir, I can, I can hear you. That's not really what he said, but that's what I felt. I said, well, uh, you know, large coffee, please. He says, okay, but that's going to be 
15 minutes. Did they ever do this to you? Maybe this is, this is just me, where they, they have to, to have you park somewhere, and they, and they say, we'll get to you tomorrow. You know, and you spend the night in the parking lot, and you're, you're just like, is anybody out there for me? You know, strange. The police come by. Hey, what are you doing here? I'm just waiting on my combo. That's kind of how I felt. And so I realized what had happened. They probably stopped serving coffee at like 9 a.m. And so they're going to have to brew a new pot of coffee at 6.30 p.m. because that's just what we have to do for this guy. But it's going to be 15 minutes. And if you don't mind waiting. And finally, I just said, hey, um, no, it's okay. You know what? Don't worry about it. Um, You know, and you feel like you have to apologize. You feel like you have to apologize for being their customer. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I want to give you my money. So I drove away, and in that very moment, I made a vow. And you've done this before. You know what I'm talking about. You've had these experiences. You make a vow. You say, in that moment, I will never come back here again. And I I went a little bit further, and, you know, I took a, a key, and I, I drew blood on, my, on the palm of my hands and I put it against the windshield as a, as a memorial. Never again will I go back here. Okay, so I'm being a little bit exaggerative, but there's that moment where you lose confidence in something that you once had confidence in. Or, or you, you want so badly for them to win you over, but they just don't. We can lose confidence in the church. Oh, I should get a witness on that. Yeah, all right, thank you. You're with me. We lose confidence in the church. Why do we lose confidence in the church? For a few reasons. One of them I talked about last week. I spent 45 minutes talking about crazy people. We lose confidence in the church because of crazy people, people who frustrate us, who annoy us, who hurt us. If you weren't here last week, go download it. Go listen to it. And I'm telling you, you will be set free because you will realize that flawed people aren't in the way of the church. Flawed people are the church. And that's why Jesus came. He came to seek and save those who were lost. And that is flawed people. And that is you and me. Yeah, thank God. Because I'm a mess. I'm a mess. What else? We lose confidence in the church because of uncomfortable experiences. We've all had uncomfortable experiences at church. We've had that moment where somebody in the lobby maybe chose that moment to confront us. We've been at our community group and all of a sudden somebody starts talking about some weird theology that they're working through and you're like, whoa, 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 this is weird. Or somebody starts to exercise a spiritual gift that you think, whoa, I don't know about that one. That one's pretty strange. I don't think I have a demon in me. You have an uncomfortable experience. The preacher or the teacher says something to you and it makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You felt uncomfortable and you started to lose confidence in the church. Another way that we lose confidence in the church is because of a disposable mindset. You know, we live in a, in a community where there's hundreds and hundreds of churches and that's a good thing. There are people uh, meeting all over the city in in beautiful old church buildings and shiny new church buildings and in homes and living rooms and in, and in schools all over this community. And it seems like every weekend a new church is launched. And that's a beautiful thing because the gospel, man, it's big enough and it's on the move. And there's so many people who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and grow up in it. The downside of that is it creates a disposable mindset about the church, which means, you know, If I have a a situation or or something that I don't like at the one church, I can just kind of throw it away. Like, well, let me move on to the next one. Let me move on to the next one. It's sort of like buying in bulk at Sam's. You know what I'm saying? We do that with the church, especially in our community. We don't live in an area where it's sort of church forsaken. We live in an area where it's hyper church and we have a disposable mindset. And that could cause us to sort of look at the church like, meh. Some of you may have been there. Some of you may be there right now. A loss of confidence, though, is really a loss of vision. I'm going to say that again. A loss of confidence isn't about the church. 
it's not about God's design. God didn't have a flaw in the design of the church. And then all of a sudden, we discovered the flaw. Oh, well, God, you know, hey, I, I can kind of see here that this is messed up because of all these flawed people and all these uncomfortable situations. And man, it just doesn't seem like I, I really care anymore. So, hey, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And that's what we do. When we lose sight of God's vision for the church, we try to follow Jesus alone. We do what man has done since the beginning of time, and that is when we don't like God's vision for something, we make our own vision for it. We take things in our own hands. Hey, this doesn't make me feel comfortable. I'm not really down with this anymore. So, hey, thank you for first draft. God, I'll take it from here and make it better. And we all know what happens when we take matters into our own hands. Things get dark and things get weird. And we can do that when we lose confidence in the church because it's really losing confidence or losing perspective and losing the vision that God has for the church. And today, I want to talk about what is God's vision for the church because when we realize what God's vision is for the church, we can answer this question. What creates love for and confidence in the church? What creates love for and confidence in the church? Because you may have driven away from the gathering some time ago, and you're back. You're back maybe to think, maybe this time my suspicions Maybe this time my expectations. Maybe this time all of those things that I thought about the church will not be so. Maybe they'll win me over again. And the reality is if you don't have the right vision for the church, which is God's vision of the church, the church can never win you over. You will always lose confidence in it. Why? Because you have your own vision for it. Mm -hmm. It's about to get real. So, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. The writer of Hebrews, no one knows who this writer is. Some people think it's the Apostle Paul. Some people think it's someone else. Some people think it's a man. Some people even think it's a woman. We don't know who wrote this. What we do know is whoever wrote it has a Hebrew background. They are Jewish because they are writing to a Jewish audience a group of Jewish believers, people who grew up in the old covenant and the way of Judaism and under the law and have become believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And so this writer is trying to appeal to them and say, hey, I get it. I understand it. Let me point you back to some of the things that the Mosaic law was foreshadowing and is relevant to you today. So what does the writer say? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. What is the writer doing right now? The writer is trying to get this church to understand God's vision for the church. Not your vision, not my vision, not my neighbor's vision, God's vision for the church. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. Stop right there. What Jesus did for you and me was something that humankind has tried to do since the beginning of time, and that is through religion, through spiritualism, through magic and conjuring and all of those things, and that is to connect with the presence of God. And what he says here is Jesus took care of that. He has ushered you and me into the presence of God. He says, and since we have, here we go, and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into, right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Write this down. Jesus' death and resurrection 
allows us to enter God's presence. That's what that passage of scripture reminds us of. What does that mean? It means that we, the church, proclaim and reproclaim the fact that Jesus' death and resurrection ushers us into the presence of God. God's presence is not only in here, God's presence, if you believe and follow Jesus, is in you. I'm gonna say that again. God's presence isn't only in here. If you believe and follow Jesus Christ, God's presence is in you. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. And you and I forget that. We do. We forget it. We wake up and we go to work and we pay our mortgages and we're trying to get the kids here and there and we're trying to raise them up and then we're trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out all these things that, that go and all of a sudden we forget, wait a minute, God's presence is not only around me, it's in me. And that's why we gather together with a group of people because God has an essential encounter for us to experience to gather, together and that is, hey, let's not forget y'all, Jesus Christ has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. He has ripped back the curtain to the most holy place. And God's presence is here among us and in us and before us and behind us. And that's how much God loves us. That's God's vision for the church, that we would proclaim that and reproclaim that and live in the confidence of that. But also, God transforms our hearts to love what he loves. Here's what he wants to do in you and me, even today as we are in this place. He wants us to fall in love what he loves. He wants us to fall in love with what he loves. And what does he love? He loves this world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for. He wants some of you to go to Uganda. He, he wants some of you, he, today, he is breaking some of your hearts. You heard Zach up here talking about, we're gonna send another group of people with first world resources, both human and capital, across the world to a third world village, and we're gonna help establish a church and a thriving economy, and we're gonna see the love of God flourish and thrive for generations to come. You know why? And you know where that comes from? It comes from the heart of God. He's been on the move and he's been doing that since the beginning. And he wants you and I to participate in that. And our hearts, listen, our hearts by ourselves, doing our own thing, taking matters into our own hand, we just don't do that. We just don't do it. We, we just kind of figure out, you know what, maybe if I just read more of the Bible and learn more Bible trivia and and, and, you know, get a really heady theology, you know, maybe I'll love more. And the reality is, until you and I get around some people and grow in that love and love each other, we will not be loving what God loves, and that is the people that he has put before us. And that's why we see what we see next. Let us tightly, let us hold tightly, he says, without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. What does he say? He says, hey, keep getting together and urging each other, why? So that you will love greater and that you will act in that love in greater ways. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, which means some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What does he say? I want you to love what I love, and I love my people. And I want you to love them too. And I want you to get together with them and spur each other on in what? In love. And great works. Listen, I want to say this because I think this town needs to hear this. 
Do we need to read the scriptures? Absolutely. Do we need to go to Bible studies? Absolutely. Do we need to sing pretty songs to the Lord that are anthems, that, that, are, that, are, that are ballads to the Lord and do that together? Absolutely. Do we need to learn more? Do we need to teach more about the scriptures? Absolutely. Do we need to exercise and identify and practice spiritual gifts in the church? Absolutely we do. But the whole point is that we would love like God. Not that we would become weird and arrogant and judgmental religious people. And if you and I find ourselves reading more and knowing more about the Bible and we're still an unkind jerk, come down here today and I want to pray for you because that's what can happen. And that's what often takes place when we try to take the church in our own hands. Thank you very much, God. I've lost confidence in this whole gathering thing, so I'm gonna take it and do my own thing with it. And what happens? We get all heady and we get all smart and we get all high on ourselves and we get really, really bad at love and the acts of love in our life. Why? Because we have to be around flawed people to do it. We have to be with the church and be the church and receive from the church and give to the church. God wants you to love like he does and he wants you to love what he loves. Think about this for a second. Think about if I got a call this afternoon. Hey, Pastor John, yeah. Man, we'd love for you to come to our Super Bowl party. It's gonna be awesome. We want you to be there. Oh, man, that's great. What do you want me to bring? Bring some bean dip. Oh, yeah, I can do that. You want me to bring my famous guacamole? Oh, yeah, bring your famous guacamole. It's going to be awesome. Okay, I'll be there. Can't wait. Can't wait for the halftime show. It's going to be awesome. All right, so uh, what would you like for Tammy to bring? Oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't want you to bring Tammy. What, what, what do you mean? No, we like you, but we don't like Tammy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, wait a minute. You, you want to hang out with me, but you don't want to hang out with my wife? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bring your guacamole. It'll be awesome. Well, hold up. Before you hang up, I just want you to know I'm not going to be coming to your Super Bowl party. Well, why? Because I don't know if I like you, to be honest with you. Well, why? Because you don't like the one that I like the most, and that is my wife. And if you don't like her, you really don't like me, so why don't you, and by the way, who do you want to win? Oh, you want the Rams to win? Go Patriots. Yeah, because I don't even like your team. Click. Okay, I wouldn't do all that, right? But here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal. When you and I talk about someone that we love and somebody says, I like you and I wanna hang out with you but I don't wanna hang out with this person, then what do you think? You think, well, I don't wanna hang out with you. And that's essentially what we're saying when we say, yeah, God, I love Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sins eliminate sin, evil, and death for me. I never have to be bullied or chained by that again. Thank you for raising him from the dead. Oh, thank you, because now his spirit is in me, and I have the promise of eternity with you. Oh, but about your bride, she's crazy, she's ugly, and I don't want to hang out with her. Then you don't want to hang out with me because that's who I love. That's who I sent Jesus to die for and raise from the dead. And that's who I want you to love. In fact, Jesus went as far as to say, hey, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Meaning, if you really want to express your love for God, Express your love for the person beside you. The greatest way that you and I will express our love for God 
is not by going to more Bible studies. It's not by getting more religion. It's not by getting smarter. It's not by getting more learned. Fill in the blank. It's not by going through the motions of all the things that we do. It's by washing the feet of the people that he's put in your life that is called his church. He says, when you do that, you are ultimately expressing your love for me. So listen, don't exercise spiritual gifts. Don't tell me how much you know about the scriptures. If you're not willing to grow in the greatest gift, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and that is the gift of love. Because, as Paul says, without love, all that other stuff is obnoxious to God. Mm. Somebody needed to hear that. Somebody just got free in that. And I believe that is a statement that needs to be made. Here's the deal, and here's the reality. Our hearts can drift, and our values can shift. Why? Because we're human beings, and we need to be reminded of what God's vision, not our vision, but what God's vision is for the church. And that is a group of people claiming, proclaiming, and reproclaiming the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it has spurred them on to greater love and greater works of love until kingdom come. That's who we are. And that's who we need to be. And that's how we have to keep coming back to this over and over and over again. God's vision for the church, love and good works on heaven or on earth as it is in heaven. Embracing and pursuing God's vision for the church creates love for and confidence in the church. You will begin to love what God loves when you continue to recognize God's love for you. My children are North Carolina basketball fans. Why? Because I am a North Carolina basketball fan. And I said, if you're gonna live here, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, I, I, that's, I didn't say that. No, I, I never forced that on them. I just cheered them on and I turned on the game, and I took them to the Smith Center, to games, and, and I wore the colors, and I talked to them about the history, and I celebrated the national championships. I, I celebrated the wins. I, I felt the losses. And so what happens is they're around what I love, and they start to love what I love. And that's why we need to be around each other, because God has essential encounters for us in this gathering. And one of them, and I would say the big one, is that we have opportunities to love and serve his people. That's, that's the church. And listen, you and I can't download that. We can't stream that. I love the innovation that is happening in our times. Even as I speak, people are able to hear what I'm saying all around the world. And that's a powerful thing. But there's something that God is doing in this room. There's something that he's doing in this room that we just have to be in the room for. There's something that he's gonna do in your community group this week that you just have to be in the room for. You can't get a text message about that. You, you, you can't just get a, get a voicemail from somebody who was there and have the same experience. You have to be in the room because it's where your love grows. It's what God is showing us, his presence in the gathering. And that's critical for us to remember. Three things we need to go after in 2019. First, some of you need to ask God to reignite your love for him and for his church. I think that's where some of you are today. I think you, you, you lost confidence in the church. And maybe it was people, maybe it was uncomfortable situations. Maybe it was just a disposable mindset. Eh, I don't need this anymore. I don't know. But I think today, today is the day where as we, as we respond, maybe you just need to get on your knees and just repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I lost my way. I'm sorry that I let my values and my vision shift and drift. And I need you to reignite that in me today. 
In fact, I'm gonna invite you when we respond, our care and response team will be down here and maybe you just need some people from this church to get around you and pray. I, I love, I love the space that God creates when his people open themselves up to whatever he wants to do. Second, encourage others with how the gospel won in our gathering. You know, we need to tell the stories of what God is doing in this room. And we need to tell the stories of what God is doing in our community groups and our serving teams and our global teams. Uh, last week, I, I spoke uh, with a woman who came to this gathering for the ver very first time last week. Um, she wrestled with anxiety and doesn't like to be in crowds. She wrestles with her belief in God, but through some relationships, uh, she started watching our church online. Her work shift got canceled last Sunday. She woke up and she said, you know what, I think I'm going to, I think I'm gonna go to that that church. I think I'm gonna go to that gathering. And she drove here despite, despite her anxiety, despite her fear of crowds. And she said in this text that she sent me, she says, she goes, I went to the, to the new here and they were so friendly. And she said, this lady brought me down here and she took care of me and she showed me so much friendliness and warmth. And she said, I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to, to hear what God had to say through the message. And she said, I was the one who raised my hand to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. I was the one. And you know something? You need to share that story. I need to share that story. We, we need to talk about the fact that, that, that people come down here with with physical illness and emotional pain and, and spiritual darkness and through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gathering of his church, breakthrough happens every week in this church. Chains are broken. The dead, the dead marriages are resurrected in this church. That's powerful stuff. Share those stories. Tell people what God is doing in this church. I had a guy come up to me after or uh, at some point during the first service, and he just said, hey, I want you to know um, that I've been bitter towards you personally, and I just need you to forgive me. And I looked at him and I said, I forgive you. I forgive you. Of course I forgive you. And he says, I want to be united with you, and I want to be united with this church. And I said, man, let's go. Let's do this. Because that happened an hour and a half ago. Reconciliation in a relationship in my life happened 90 minutes ago in this room. We should tell people about that. We should model that. We should tell the world, look, we've got the answer. And it's not more religion. And it's not more politics. It's not more of what the world is trying to figure out. It's Jesus' death and resurrection and his coming again and his people proclaiming that and re-proclaiming that and celebrating that and growing in their love for one another and growing in the works of love for one another and taking that out into the highways and the byways, not with arrogance and not with self-righteousness, but with brokenness and courage. Church, that's who we are. We are the hope of the world. And you should shout for that. And you should weep for that. And that should break your heart. And it should take you out of here with a new vision and a new spirit. Not one that you have conjured. Not one that I've made up. But one that God set before us through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. It is the hope that we have, Brentwood Church. And we need to proclaim it. And we need to take it to the highways and the byways. And we need to start right here in this room. Right here in this room. And maybe you need to walk across the room and you need to say, I need your forgiveness. I've held bitterness in my heart towards you. Maybe you did a business deal with somebody in this room and you won't make eye contact with them in the lobby and you've thought about running. How about today? How about today you walk up to that person and say, you know what? I've had bitterness. 
and, and I just need your forgiveness. And I want to make this right. Can we meet? Can we meet right now? Can we meet this week? I, I don't want this anymore. Maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to grab the hand of your spouse today. And you guys have been in church for weeks going through the motions. And you need, as a man, as a husband, as a father, to say, you know what? I need to repent. I need to repent for my passiveness as a leader. I, I, need, to, I, I need your forgiveness right now for how I've led this home or how I've not led this home. I don't know what God's doing in you, but he's doing something in you. He's doing something in this room because you're in it. And he wants you to be obedient to that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? I want you to do some business with God in this moment. We're gonna sing in just a moment. As always, our response stations are open to take communion, to light a candle of intercessory prayer, to write down prayer requests that our team will pray for during the week. I wanna invite you to do that if God's leading you to do that. But some of you need prayer. I wanna invite you as we sing for you to come down here and, and just get prayer. Prayer for courage, prayer for healing, prayer for breakthrough. Maybe you just need to drop to your knees right where you are while the rest of us sing. Maybe you need to reach out to somebody around you and just say, would you pray with me? Let, let, let that happen because that's what, that's what we can't download. That's what we can't stream. It's what God is doing here and now in this moment. And his spirit is alive and well and on the move in this room. So I'm gonna invite you as we sing for you just to, to be obedient to what God is asking you to do. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray over this gathering, this assembly of people. You've given us each other. And Father, I just pray that we grow deeper and deeper in love. First and foremost with you, but also with one another. Father, teach us how to love each other. Teach us how to love each other in our sin, Father. Teach us how to forgive each other when we break each other's hearts. Teach us how to wash each other's feet in the name of Jesus. Teach us to do this right here and right now in this moment. And it is in Christ's name that I pray this.